Ladies and gentlemen, I'm uh, terribly sorry to interrupt your coffee and your conversation, but um, we're going to have to crack on as time uh, takes no prisoners, as they say. Um, so, I'm Jack Watling, I'm the Land Warfare Fellow here, and I think after that early first discussion where we laid out the challenge that we're facing, it's now turning to those who have to deal with how to respond to it. And that's really the focus of this panel. If we're in this dynamic of increasing compet competition between states and seeking compet uh, competitive advantage, then how are different countries rising to that challenge? And we have a fantastic panel to explore that pro uh, problem. First, we have Mr. Gerdermas Jaglinskas, the Vice Minister of Defense for Lithuania. We have Major General Catherine Tui, the Director of Capability for the Australian Army. And we have Major General Charles Boudin, the Director of Capability for the French Army. So a very diverse uh, set of problems facing those different forces. And I think we will begin with Gerdermas, if you want to kick off. Sure. Well, thank you, Jack. Uh, it's great to be here as a, as a former Army officer. I'm really honored to be here among such a land forces conferences. Uh, sometimes, oftentimes, you go to these large conferences of so all different services, but particularly Army, I think it's, it's great to be back here. Um, now, I will present, I will provide a perspective from a small country. Uh, now, we're Lithuania against a three million country uh, population. Um, we're part of NATO, part of EU. Uh, we're, we are at the very eastern part of, the, of NATO, so very facing a lot of existential to us threats uh, uh, posed by, by the Russian regime and, and other, others there. And uh, now, but before that, uh, let me just start with some backdrop. And I had, I had worked in banking before, and before you start selling bonds, you always give a backdrop. So it's called, that's the word I've learned. Uh, so, you know, I'm trying to, to provide some context, again, specifically from a country, from a small country like Lithuania. So to, I think for us, really, the change, and as I think for many organizations or countries, change is the only constant at the moment. And that change, we sort of look at it uh, from, from my perspective as a, as a deputy minister in charge of capability development for armed forces and infrastructure, procurement, and defense industry. To me, it's really through, comes through three major lines of thinking. First is a political gyrations. And as a, uh, well, not, not a politician per se, but as, a, as a, someone representing a political wing uh, in, in, the, in the government, I would say that this is really that rise of populism is here and it's turning us all inwards. Now, on the way here on the plane, I was thinking how, how this is affecting us in terms of cap how we build capability. And I think one, or, you know, really the focus, the tendency now is to turn inwards because it's much simpler, it's much easy, easier, it's easy to sell that to the public, it's easy to sell that to the, to the populations. So you turn to local industry, you turn to national interest, you turn to less complex forms of cooperation, such as you know, internally or bilateral, which is, which is much easier than doing something internationally. So I think that's, in, I think in a way, because the result is quick and visible. The second thing that I think uh, we're, we're affected by, and something was mentioned before, is the technology. Uh, to me, that's a big hope. Technology, I think, the whole, uh, the, the Moore's Law evolution to, to the level that we're at now, I think with the computing power, and with a lot of things happen, it's, it's a great hope. Now, of course, we need to invest properly. We need to allocate the resources very efficiently in order to get the result we want. And in the, in the military realm, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a real, dynamic field where I think, but again, the, to me it's, it's, it's a hope because it's, you know, where you can do a lot of things with that. And the third part is, is financial. I think defense budget ties, tide is rising. Now for us in Lithuania, we're, uh, the turning point was 2014 when the, when the Ukraine war, when the war in Ukraine uh, erupted. Uh, we, uh, we've for, we quadrupled our budget since then. Now that doesn't mean all good. When you quadruple, when fast grow, when growing pains are painful as, as they are because you need to balance the budget, you need to make sure you don't buy things that you don't need. But I think it's this is something we've uh, we've seen again in I think a lot along a lot along the whole NATO spectrum. And I think countries are well at, uh, speaking from Lithuania's perspective. We've reached the 2% of GDP, not because of the tweets, but actually because we actually needed to build that capability and we were on track for that. So, but again, this is based on economic growth. That sustainability of the economy is the, the true, truly important for in order to, to keep that, that budget growth uh, in line. 
and, and we have been beneficiaries of solid economic performance in the past several years, so, but we'll see in the future. Now, from this backdrop, how does a small country like, uh, you know, like Lithuania, again, who, which I represent, can transform? How do we think about it? To us, the, you know, the whole national security strategy coalesces around a concept of, there's been a very neat question and discussion right in the previous panel about deterrence, what deterrence is, what it means, what it deterrence by punishment, deterrence by, uh, by, by what? Punishment, the next one, D deterrence by? Denial, denial, sorry, I just fell off. <laughs> not, tr not trying to answer to, to, to question here, the, the Jack, but I just forgot. Uh, so how do we deter? Again, for, to us, deterrence is key, and deterrence strategy is really, is, is a threefold, is a three-pillar strategy. First of all, is, is really we need to build the capabilities, something that we had not built for the past 30 years ever since we've become independent. So that's why we focus on, 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 on light units, on maneuverability, on, uh, on indirect fire support, on intelligent, I-STAR intelligence capabilities, as well as, um, as air defense. Because, seeing, again, that is our uh, geography, this is where we are facing the, the enemy. Now, another thing is, second part of our, our deterrent strategy is partnerships. In 2014, we, you know, the, the Ukraine crisis erupted, and we were thinking, what, Okay, we have, we're, part, we're members of NATO, but what does NATO do? NATO has Article 5, which means that uh, all for one, one for all, if, if it's invaded, countries invaded, then you, uh, you call Article 5. Well, yes, procedurally, yes, but how do we do it live? How do we, how do we get, it? what are the steps to get there? And I think we decided, decided politically after 2014 and 2016 by NATO to allocate forces to the east, uh, so-called enhanced forward presence uh, uh, battalions in, in, in Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, and Poland are serving the purpose of that, they're kind of strengthening the partnership, but again, how do we, uh, how do we, what do we do as an alliance, I think, in a, uh, in, in when the crisis erupts? These are the key questions I think we need to answer, and we strengthen in that partnership, because that's, that's what we need to do. We're too small to, to defend ourselves, so it's, uh, it's really the partnership aspect is important. And the third, and the third aspect of, uh, in, in our strategy of, of achieving deterrence is, uh, is resilient society. And this, is, this has been contentious. I've spoken to a lot of uh, foreign officials and local officials in Lithuania and, and, and off military officers as well. And there's some doubts that you, that for example, conscription. We ju we've just reestablished conscription, not just, but, but four, four years ago we reestablished uh, conscription. Mandatory service, mandatory military service where young, young men and women go for, for about nine, ten months and, and do their part, do their part after high school. Yeah, but, you know, whether it's, uh, what is this, and the questions I've received uh, is are whether this is official, whether it's efficient use of resources uh, to get the most out of our forces. Is it is this the most efficient to get the deterrence working that we have this con conscription back? And I think, uh, you know, the key, but this was the key re realization also. After the 2014, we looked at the armed forces, the status of our readiness, status of our equipment, status of our, of our morale. And one of the key stark lessons was that uh, really military and society were out of touch. And it, this was, was a reality because we did not have conscription in the past 10 years, ever since to about 2008. And, well, we, we knew we had to do something. So, you know, based on this realization, we've, uh, we've reinstated the conscription. It's about 4,000 uh, young men and women are being called every year. And, um, and I think we have some good insights. I think, first of all, is that the young people want to and are willing to contribute. This, there was some, there's a lot of PR, a lot of Facebook tweet, Twitter, uh, discontent when we when we said that we're reinstating conscription, but actually, y uh, they're all volunteers. In the past four years, we've done the conscription. These are all volunteers. They didn't. They, we we use a lottery when we rank and, and then we call them. But actually, everybody volunteered. So, to us, it's it's a sign that you know that uh, society is well aware of the threats. The young men and women are aware of the threats, and they come and they contribute and they. And a lot of them stay in the force as well. We have about 25, 30 percent of the conscripts every year that stay in the. They want to stay in the armed forces as a, as a, um, NCOs and and, and uh, as, as a junior NCOs. The second thing is that we saw is that the military can absorb the intake of conscripts. Now 
the model of the Lithuanian army is mixed. We have professionals, but we had some space to, to have the, the, cons the conscripts in. And I think this was, again, uh, hard work by our military. But, you know, when we, when we talk about three, 4,000 uh, young men and women to big, make, make sure that we can absorb them, the military can. And I think it really adds to the military's readiness because we, we now, you know, the platoon commanders now have people to train. They have people to lead. So I think it's, um, it's again, it's, a, it's a definitely a good decision from that perspective. Now, as expected, the key bottlenecks and challenges were, first is infrastructure, second is people, basically NCOs were able to train and having enough of them, sufficient numbers, to, they could train these people, and uh, overall military structure. Now, the army is about, it's called 15,000 people, and when you add 4,000 conscripts, it, it affects tr structures, it affects, um, uh, you know, basically, uh, we come to a conclusion that we need some new battalions, new units. So I think that's something to consider going forward. Now, conscripts as a recruitment source, I mentioned that. We really had a positive impact on readiness and on society. Perception in the military is the, has never been before, really. It is the highest in the history. And I think, I'm not just saying as a, as a politician, just bragging about it, but really I'm, I'm proud, as a former army officer, I'm, I'm proud that you know our military is viewed very positively among our public. That's, that's a simple conclusion here. And the future expansion. Now, we calculated that, about, that to have a universal conscription, which personally I very much support, uh, to have it working there, it, it will require a lot more resources, a lot more military units, newly established military units. But again, we go back to the same bottlenecks and challenges. We need infrastructure. We need professional soldiers who will be training and leading these young men and women, and we need very clear structures, of basically new, new units who, um, where these conscripts could train. And, you know, the number seven I have here is that so far this is really n has not been a whole of society project. This has not been a whole of government even approach. Um, it was a purely military, purely a military venture. Now, it's okay. But I think if we talk about the society, and really, the, there are two goals. There's a dual goals for, uh, for the reinstatement of conscription. First of all is to build the reserve force, that we have these soldiers who, who, tr who train, who, who, um, who, who go undergo the conscription. They come out and they're able to, to serve in the forces whenever mobilization happens or whenever day X comes. But the second, uh, the, I think even more important uh, for, for the society is making sure that we have, uh, that the, the society is resilient, that we have awareness of the threats of the society. So it's really building that, that knowledge within the, the society. It's really the, the leveler of the, almost of the society in this sort of unequal, uh, unequal societies that we have now. This is a great tool to, to build a society that's, that has unity of purpose. And uh, I think to get, well, well, the next step, I think, militarily, to have a universal conscription, which would mean four times more conscripts than we have now, it's probably untenable and unfeasible from a military standpoint, from resources perspective. But there is that that you kind know, of unity of purpose uh, goal that I think we could achieve. But for that to achieve, it's it should not be just a military uh, approach. It's really about the whole of society involving involving. Uh, other ministries, other other bureaucracies within the government, and I think um, you know if you, for example, you know uh, having a, a contest, so top top four thousand become conscripts, the others go to hospitals, go to children houses, other things. So it's it's really about uh, creating that service element within the society that would be the the true goal that the, so the vision that I would have. But again, we're pretty far from that, and um, so that that concludes my. Remarks and you know beat navy. Thank you very much. Um, and I, I think it's yeah, it's worth emphasizing the fact that beyond your background in banking, you were also a mechanized infantry officer and a graduate of West Point. So you very much have experience across the spectrum in this field. Um, whereas Major General Tui, you started off as a signaler, I think, as your operational experience, but have spent a long time now deep in the capability kind of area, working across the spectrum. And I think Australia's uh, Land 400 program is one of those really systematic approaches. So um, I look forward to hearing your remarks. Great, thank you. Uh, CGS sir, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, fellow speakers, good morning. 
I'd like to start by thanking Rusi for the opportunity to be here today to talk about what the Australian Army is doing to adapt for competition. By way of introduction, in addition to doing uh, Land 400, I work in our Army headquarters and my team is responsible for future concepts and end-to-end -end management of land capability. That's helicopters through to radios, through to watercraft and armoured vehicles. The Australian Army describes the modern operating environment and our response to it through an idea we call accelerated warfare. Accelerated warfare sees an operating spectrum of cooperation, competition and conflict existing simultaneously in space and time. But competition isn't new. It's just newly important, again. Competition, short of open conflict, has been rediscovered as a tool by established and new actors. As the saying goes, history doesn't repeat, but it does rhyme. We have been here before, albeit in different times. The American diplomat George F. Kennan described political war in 1948 as, and I quote, the employment of all the means at a nation's command, short of war, to achieve its national objectives. Such operations are both overt and covert. They range from such overt actions as political alliances, economic measures, and white propaganda, to such covert operations as clandestine support of friendly foreign elements, black psychological warfare, and even encouragement of underground resistance in hostile states. Many will recognise the features Kennan describes writ large in the various chapters of the Cold War. This was not that long ago, particularly when you consider the concluding chapter was written in the very early careers of many senior military officers here today. So we know this historical rhyme, but we also need to understand the context in which it is recited so we can respond to the challenge in the right key and the right verse. The context of the challenge isn't universal. Australia's circumstances are uniquely different to the European experience largely represented in this room. Consider these facts. We have the sole occupancy of a large island continent. And we have peacefully transformed politically and socially in a relatively short 231 years. From being a penal colony at the distant edge of the British Empire to a highly successful and multicultural G20 nation, endowed with massive natural resources at the pivot point of the Indo-Pacific the most dynamic region on earth. The world's largest markets, the majority of the world's megacities, the largest trading ports by tonnage and volume, and 10 of the world's largest militaries are all resident in our region. But such dynamism, wealth, and geography brings with it challenges. Our region is impacted by natural disasters and climate change, cyber warfare, the proliferation of missile technology, major state rivalry, drug trafficking, piracy, illegal fishing and terrorism. In the face of such challenges and in an environment of ongoing competition, the Australian Government has reasserted our sovereign interests and committed to further deepening our regional engagement. The aim being to help build a region that is strategically secure environmentally stable and politically sovereign. Ultimately, Australia seeks to be the security partner of choice in our region. This involves the deepening of people-to-people -people ties to form enduring partnerships, mutual respect and regional influence. As we all understand, you cannot surge trust. You cannot pluck relationships from thin air when circumstances are dire. They must be in place beforehand. As a people force in a region where personal relationships increasingly matter, 
the Australian Army has a key role to play. Our program of engagement activities are at record levels. Over 5,000 Australian soldiers contribute annually to Army's persistent presence globally and in our region, a significant commitment from a total force of only 45,000. We have 190 people permanently posted in partner nations and a further 160 posted overseas in support of other defence groups. Army conducts over 250 international engagement activities with over 25 countries annually. And in 2018, Australia trained more than 7,000 soldiers in their own countries and Army contributed with partners to the training of more than 13,000 soldiers in operational theatres. Earlier this year, we created a standing joint task force under our deployable joint force headquarters to facilitate the command, control and planning of Australia's engagement in the Southwest Pacific. This JTF leads a carefully calibrated program of engagement with a range of activities, including infrastructure projects, sporting camps, we are Australian, band concerts and training activities. Supporting this framework, Exercise Indo-Pacific Endeavour 19 has recently concluded. This is an annual three-month-long exercise which allows our joint amphibious force to participate in bilateral and multilateral activities and training across the Southwest Pacific and South Asia. Much of our approach to competition goes to the so-called soft capability edge of people and professionalism. If you like, competition is not about the defence of terrain. Instead, it is about the defence of ideas and values. But there is also a hard capability edge in our approach to competition. If we are to be the security partner of choice in our region, we must also be regarded as a credible and lethal combat force. That is, an army which is trusted and effective in competition and decisive across all domains in conflict. This sees significant investment in preparedness, so we can be ready now for competition and future ready for conflict. It is also the reason why Army is going through an extensive recapitalisation of our capabilities and platforms. Lieutenant General Rick Burr, the Chief of the Australian Army, has outlined his modernisation priorities for us to be more connected, protected, lethal and enabled. In the next couple of years, uh, Army's protected manoeuvre capability through Land 400 will be enhanced through the acquisition of a range of new vehicles. But they will be more than just vehicles. They will be nodes on a network to enable and leverage effects from all domains. For this reason, our network is our highest modernisation priority. Army must also become more lethal through land-based enabling effects in other domains. The recently approved Integrated Air and Missile Defence System, together with a new long-range fire system, will ensure that the Army can create dilemmas for adversaries through cross-domain engagement. Increasingly, this will include effects generated in the information domain. We have had great success over the past decade with an agile rolling program of soldier equipment modernisation, combining lessons learnt from operations with emerging technology to ensure our soldiers retain a competitive advantage. Despite new technology, we believe soldiers will remain at the heart of land capability, albeit they will increasingly team with machines. Today, our Army is the largest user of drones in Australia, with drones now at almost every echelon of command. For a small army charged with the security of a large island continent, robotics and autonomous systems provide much opportunity to augment and potentially replace some soldiers doing dull, dirty and dangerous tasks, and to create mass and scale. 
Finally, to operate at the speed and scale demanded by the future operating environment, as outlined in our accelerated warfare, Army needs to be integrated by design with our sister services, other governmental agencies and our partners, both traditional and regional ones. Importantly, our focus on integration will not only pay dividends during conflict, but should also mitigate the risk of malign actors exploiting seams between partners during competition. In summary, I've touched on the Australian Army's approach to competition, one which is situated within our joint force and takes a wider whole of government perspective. It is an approach tailored for our unique regional circumstances. Our region is dynamic and competition is rising. Our approach to secure an advantage in this environment is to ensure we are a trusted and effective partner. Underpinning this is the fact we will remain a professional, credible and lethal combat force, one that is decisive in conflict, generating effects from the land and across all domains. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I think you know one of the great challenges, of course, is that we, we often develop concepts which are very integrated and then we try and implement them. And the conversion from concept to force is a particularly difficult transition to make. Um, but our next speaker, Major General Baudin, not only has a great deal of, of operational experience as an armored officer, but also in an experimental capacity. I believe you were one of the first, you commanded one of the first units to receive the Leclerc tank when it was first being developed and implemented. Um, but now, as Director of Capability, is responsible for a similarly integrated approach to modernizing France's forces. And so, I hand over to you. Thank you very much, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, um, it's a great pleasure for me to be there, but I, I hope it will be the same for, for you, because my English is very bad. You know I'm French. And I, I hope I will be... Uh, uh, I will talk in a comprehensive way, so I apologize. Uh, I will try to answer uh, with a question. Uh, the question I can say is, how does the French army remain competitive and agile in an increasingly complex environment? Indeed, it severely turns out that military engagement will be ever more demanding against an adversary who is equipped with conventional military capabilities and makes the most of the technological advances. In a context where the confrontation with such an adversary who is finally able to question our superiority is difficult, the land forces will continue to keep the decisive role to conquer the terrain in the depths of the enemy setups and in contact with the populations. But the Western longer Excuse me, the Western technology advantage, especially in the cybernetic and information domains, is already not longer a strategic premise. Future operations will therefore be conducted in new conditions. Disputed air security, repeated action against the nerve centers and logistic flows, hindering of our PNT capabilities, cyber insecurity. We currently see the first signs of that. The technically more demanding combats against a strongly armed opponent are once again likely to occur. Such a perspective implies modern and interconnected but resilient warfare capabilities, able to integrate in high intensity operations with allies and partners who themselves implement high spectrum capabilities or not. That perspective requires from our armies new agility and adaptability, but also a vision. Relying on a 2035 perspective vision based on solid studies, the French Army adapts to the operational competition by resolutely choosing collaborative combat within a comprehensive army model. It develops an incremental program, evolution logic, and implements the assets to capture and rapidly integrate innovations. I will first address the Scapion program. 
the hard core of network enabled cooperative combat. And then I will develop the, perspec the uninterrupted prospective process, which is central for the French Army. The long term strategy vision of the French Army, initiated in 1999, is, is getting real with the fielding of the Scorpion program in the land forces units this year. It corresponds to an historical modernization of the French Army's capabilities, which will be equipped with so called fourth generation weapon system. The Scorpion capability and transformation is part of an overall acceleration logic of the program's dynamics, with a short-term extension to new capabilities, for instance, light hybrid Ricky armored and optionally robotized vehicles, engineers combat vehicles, main robots, etc. More than a mere renewing of a generation of combat platforms, it is above all a new way to fight owing to cooperative combat and protection capabilities based on an instant sharing of the tactical situation, alerts, and response proposals. The networking is nearly real time of sensors and shooters must make it possible to renew ground combat and to provide it with unprecedented dynamics, reactivity, and devolution. To face such technological, doctrinal, and organizational stakes, Scorpion has to be envisaged in a comprehensive way. The choice made very early relies on the system of system approach, tightly intermingling weapon systems, veteranics, information, and communication system. It was indispensable in 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 <laughs> to conduct at the same time as a program a doctrinal reflection. The Scorpion Battle Lab has been created in order to conduct doctrinal experimentations supported by simulation. The Scorpion Combat Experimentation Force is a unit in charge of supporting the Army transformation. It carries our tactical exercise in the field, making it possible to measure the efficiency of the Scorpion combined armed battle groups. In addition to the Scorpion transformation, the French Army is undergoing an overall transformation of its capability spectrum with a high level of ambition. That transformation must enable us to meet the operational challenges of the next 20 years. We address the capabilities transition for the perspective of the end states, which operational demand should we meet, rather than from the assets, with what? Let's talk about perspective. The preservation and development of a comprehensive army model are part of coherent prospective approach. It is indeed because the French army staff thought about the future in 1999 that we will receive the first Scorpion vehicle in 2019. We now have to go beyond the Scorpion step and shed light on the next one, the step beginning in 2040. We will call it the 2040 ground and air mobile combat system. It is therefore necessary to conduct as thorough a study as 20 years ago. This is the very purpose of the document written in the fall 2016, constantly updated future land action, and of its capability application signed by the chief of the French army in January 2019. Whereas future land action describes the condition of future land engagements, its capability version describes the practical details and prepares the future 2040 ground and air mobile combat system. The future combat system will be the system of new fully controlled technological borders, artificial intelligence, augmented reality, cyber, cloud, energies, robots, future communications, active protection, directed energy weapons, etc. Where is this future 2040 system of force leading us? I can see at least two key points. First, introducing fifth generation systems. That should be the objective of study 
of the future French German common indirect fire support system and the main ground combat system. In that framework, some questions have to be answered. How to can we assess the mid-century combination of attack helicopters and resilient tactical UAVs? To which extent will the military be ready to accept robotization? In order to avoid losing time in that field, ground robots will be assessed in operation outside the national territory in 2020. In a nutshell, we conduct Scorpion with already preparing 2040 extension. This prospective approach renewed by the Army directly contributes to its agility and its capacity to adapt to operational competition. Conclusion. The durable competitivity of the French Army will imply first cooperative combat combining multiple effects in early real time. Second, its ability to integrate innovation. Third, the strengths and the agility of its prospective reflection by preparing right now the future mid-century ground and air mobile force. But is competition between allies meaning full insofar, meaningful insofar as our collective efficiency will mainly rely on a complementarity between our army models? That's the question. All in all, the durable competitivity of the French army will rely on its ability to integrate in a rapid, fluid, and flexible way into any coalition and above it all, NATO, since the operational capability of an isolated nation is vain and that more than ever, united we stand, divided we fall. Thank you. <laughs>